Kijk je weg. This sounds like a good show. Come on, can I come out and sit with you? <laughs> wow, that's very nice. Yeah. Well, then you're young at heart. Anyway. <laughs> tonight, starting tonight, we just got an 800 number for those of you home who want the jokes explained. Operators are standing by. <laughs> You're in a good mood. We got a great show for you tonight. And of course, as you probably know, there are a lot of big time confrontations this week. Uh, Reagan versus Gorbachev. The Mets versus the Astros. And me versus the Honeymooners, the Lost Episodes. Anyway, we gotta... This should be interesting. I just... I met a couple of weeks ago for the first time one of our guests tonight, Sean Penn, who is here tonight. The only reason Sean is here tonight is that every news photographer in the world is in Iceland. <laughs> so, Sean's here. Uh, we may touch on that tonight. I know it's kind of a controversial thing, but Sean, as you probably know, has had his problem with the press. Uh... You may not know, the police brought him in and asked him where he was the night Dan Rather got beat up. <laughs> this has been a hell of a week for Rather. In Iceland today, he was mauled by two polar bears. <laughs> anyway, thank you for coming tonight. A lot of you from out of town, right? And you come here. And you come, and you come here because uh, it's free. And from time to time, I try to pass on some tips so you'll have a nice vacation. Now, here's a tip for you tourists. Universal Studios has a new blood curtain, death-defying ride. It's the RTD bus ride on the way over there. <laughs> well, Reagan left today on a trip that I guess is one of the perks of being president, you know. Columbus Day weekend in Iceland. Uh, I'm going to talk about Columbus later because there's a new, some new material that came out. Did you read this on the news? About where Columbus was supposed to have landed? They say not so. Anyway, Reagan and Gorbachev, as you know, are going to meet face-to-face -face in an effort to see if they can set up a, a serious face-to-face -face meeting. <laughs> Let me give you that 800 number. <laughs> Wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be funny if Gorbachev asked Reagan for asylum? <laughs> now, talking about Columbus, um, it's been thought that Columbus never landed the United States, but he landed somewhere. A lot of uh, historians up to now thought it was the island of San Salvador. Guy came out today. A lot of people agree with him that Columbus landed 65 miles off course at some remote island in, in the Bahamas. And people believe that now. Although Columbus was a shrewd navigator, took off for India, landed in the Bahamas. If he were alive today, if Columbus, think about it, if were alive today, he would be a Russian submarine commander. <laughs> you know, I'm a little nervous today. What? NBC just announced its first Christmas special, Bob Hope in Nicaragua with Anita Bryant and the Gold Diggers. <laughs> Secretary of State George Shultz said that Nicaragua will not be another Vietnam. It's good to know. El Salvador will be another Vietnam. <laughs> Nicaragua will be another Korea. But anyway, uh, George Shultz says, now, I, Secretary of State, I'm sure, is an honest man. He says, we are not in Nicaragua. And God don't make no little green apples. <laughs> no, Schultz did say they're not American troops in Nicaragua. They're location scouts for Rambo Three. <laughs> did you see that State Department spokesman Bernard Kalb resigned? Because he was asked, apparently, to spread disinformation about Libya. And in a related story, a Kremlin spokesman resigned when he was asked to spread the truth
little flip-flop there. <laughs> now, I... <laughs> That's 800 555 <laughs> I hate to talk about kind of sad news of another performer, but the new Lucille, Lucille Ball, one of the great performers, her, her show is in trouble. You know, she went on, been on a couple of weeks, and network is trying to make the show funnier and boost the ratings. So I understand on next week's show, they show Lucy and Gail Gordon sitting in the living room watching the old Lucy show for half an hour. <laughs> Is that a little mean? Yeah. I didn't mean that. She, she's too good. Some sad news. Uh-oh. Candido Jacuzzi. <laughs> Inventor of the jacuzzi. Died yesterday. At, at the age of 83. I guess that leaves the field open to his arch rival, Hot Tub Harry. <laughs> now, a little science news just to kind of wind us up tonight was in the paper, was on the news, according to Swedish researchers, having sex over the age of 70 can improve your memory. (laughs) I said to our producer, Freddie DeCord, I said, did you know that sex over 70 can improve your memory? And Freddie says, what did you say? Anyway, tonight, one of the funniest men in the world and a good friend, Mr. Richard Pryor, is here. uh, Marvelous young actor, Sean Penn. Great young musician, plays great saxophone in his group, but Kenny G is here tonight. Stay where you are, and we'll be here. Okay, tonight. In a, in a few moments, Richard Pryor, Sean Penn, and Kenny G are here. A um, little not personal business, I guess national business. You know, from, over the years, we, uh, we have many animals on the show. Mm. It's a good spot. And back in 1978, a woman named Donna Pyle came on. She was from Iowa with her pet rooster, Baby. Now, Baby's claim to fame was that Baby would crow on demand. Just like that. Mm-hmm. Baby didn't crow too much that night. Just to refresh your memory, here is a little piece of that tape from 1978 with Baby the Rooster. How do you get him to crow, Donna? Well, I usually offer him some corn, and he usually crows. <laughs> but you know... When will that, when will that happen? I'm afraid that... <laughs> I, I'm afraid that somebody uh, made book on him and uh, throwed him one way or the other. Maybe well, he's not going to crow. Maybe he's not going to crow. <laughs> That's really what's got me worried. <laughs> All right. This week, that was in 1978. I received this letter this past week from a Mrs. Gary Walcott. She said, I'm wondering if Johnny would be interested in learning that Baby, the big rooster from Iowa that appeared on his show and stood on his desk and crowed under man, died last winter. Oh. Well, of course, I I didn't know that. (laughs) But, you know, when you sit here and guests are here, sometimes you you get kind of a kinship with them and you feel close to them. And I did, because I guess being from the Midwest, felt particularly close to Baby the Rooster. And uh, a matter of fact, I remember we had dinner after the show. (laughs) I had a glass of white wine. I always have white wine with chicken. And... (laughs) But like so many other performers who got their start on this show, we, we thought it would be fitting to have his remains shipped from Iowa so that we could all say goodbye and pay our last respects.
We are gathered here today <laughs> to pay our last respects to Baby. Baby the rooster got laid January 3rd. <laughs> 1944 on a rundown farm on the south side of Philadelphia. <laughs> Baby had few friends, few friends. His mother ignored him, his father neglected him. No one would play with him except a nearsighted cat who thought he was a tennis ball. <laughs> Coming into the world of Saul Shempelman, he changed his name to Baby and embarked on a career in show business. Who will ever forget his performance in Raiders of the Lost Ark when he screamed and jumped out of the way of Indiana Jones' Jeep? <laughs> Baby was blacklisted in the 1950s by Senator Joseph McCarthy, who accused him of being a Rhode Island Red. <laughs> Though later acquitted, he was charged with being a Russian spy and selling microfilm of the Colonel's 11 secret herbs and spices. Baby was a tireless crusader who fought for better working conditions for his fellow poultry, such as higher pay, more vacation time, and not having to be constantly chased by a guy in a bloody apron who wanted to wring his neck. In his prime, in his prime. <laughs> Baby made millions when he became the exclusive supplier he became the exclusive supplier of feathers to Liberace. Baby had grown despondent because he was being phased out of his traditional wake-up role by farmers who felt that digital alarm clocks smell better than roosters. <laughs> Near the end, Baby lost the ability to arise at dawn, preferring to sleep till one in the afternoon, earning him the nickname of President Reagan's bird. <laughs> Toward the end, Baby's vision was failing, and farmers witnessed the pathetic sight of baby on a roof trying to proposition a brass weather vane. <laughs> In his final days, baby could not find a farmer willing to dress him and he was forced to pluck himself. <laughs> the low point came when he, when he agreed to appear in a porno film, Deep Gizzard. <laughs> and because of this, his wife left him. Baby was left penniless after the divorce. His wife was awarded the house, the car, and his McNuggets. <laughs> the end came suddenly. He was told he was going to be roasted by the Friars Club. Unfortunately, they meant that literally. <laughs> Baby will receive a military burial and honor guard of farmers and dress overalls. Will administer the 21 birdshot salute. His grave will be marked by the eternal rotisserie which will forever turn in his honor. Those who wish to view the body can visit at 6 p.m. Those who wish to eat the body can arrive at 8 p.m. <laughs> to pay her final respects tonight, we have baby's widow, Irene. Also, his widow, Doris, and his widow, Evelyn and his widow Beverly, and his widow Stella, and his widow Veronica, and his widow Helga and Virginia and Black, and his widow Rose and Raquel, his widow Ro Marianne, Helen and Elizabeth, his widow Sabrina and Nancy, and Maureen, and Naomi and Lillian, and Margie and Lorraine, and Janice and Hildegard and Harriet, and Geraldine, and Dot, and Donna, and Gilda, and Denise, his widow Sheila, his widow Nadine, Millie, and Kimberly, Sylvia, Constance, Bridget, Bunny, Tiffany, and Maud. Yes, baby finally bought the farm. <laughs> Goodbye, baby. We shall all miss you. One little afterthought on our eulogy here. 
when the, when the chickens came in this afternoon, you must understand, we just didn't go out to some barnyard and get 50 chickens. These are show business chickens, folks. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm serious. Here is their card. They come from C&T Farm Animals. Now, usually if you're in this business, you have a resume, right? right? You get them and people give you a resume. The chickens, I said, tell me what the chickens have done lately. <laughs> they've, they've done a Simon and Simon, a Santa Barbara, <laughs> and three Amigos just in the past month. Those are the credits Boy. for the chickens. <laughs> they stayed right they're with stars. their stars. They're stars. It's your show business. <laughs> okay, tonight, my first guest, I consider a, a good friend. And when you see Richard Pryor on a stage, he is without a doubt one of the most inventive, uh, true to life, funny men I have ever seen. He's got a new movie coming out, late January, called Critical Condition. Would you welcome Richard Pryor? date later. <laughs> <laughs> a chicken with a veil. Yes. You she, believe this? She's very nice. It's Ethel. Ethel. Yes. You seem very How comfortable with her. Uh... How you doing, Ethel? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh really? <laughs> you want to go in the car? <laughs> Give me that bird. You you can't, to, you I can't to... sit, you, sit no, here no. the whole night and talk to you with a chicken in your lap. Well, um... If you really can't, uh, I'll give her to you, but I'm going to miss her, Johnny. Oh. <laughs> Just let her run over to Freddie over there. Okay, she's Ethel, cute. She's cute. take Ethel. a hike. <laughs> she's going to be fine. And now, now, now she's going to make chicken McNugget on my jacket. <laughs> she's nice, isn't she? Yeah. Yeah. So. You, you, you keep Anna. You, what? <laughs> they're they're going to come and take Ethel. Go ahead. Put her in, uh, put her in <laughs> Richard. I know. Oh, I know. <laughs> Mom. We'll put her in your dressing room. Okay, thank you. <laughs> take, her, take her home for dinner. No, she's okay. had dinner. Take her to remove you. Remember that joke? <laughs> anyway, good to see you. Good didn't to the see last you. time you were on the show, didn't you follow animals or ducks or something? No, pigs. Pigs. <laughs> you had yeah, I remember them pigs you had up here. Whoop. Yeah. Uh, Rim. 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 Yeah. You're... I was on a pig farm when I was a kid. My grandfather had pigs. I used to have to slop them all the time. They call it slop them. You put it in a trough. And then you say, Suey! And they come and get it. And... Suey, you do that yeah. very well. Yeah, thank you. I didn't know you expected that. <laughs> no, that's, that's what you call, uh, call hogs or pigs, yeah. right? Suey! 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 Yeah. I yeah. didn't know you spent any time on a farm. Yeah, I spent a lot of time on the farm. I did two years. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't, I don't mean the honor farm, no. No, that's another farm. <laughs> I always got the idea, you're a city kid, you know. Yeah, I was in the city, but my grandparents on my mother's side had a farm. And they used to come and get me in the summer and take me to the farm to live with them and learn rural country life. There's another side to life, like getting up early in the six o'clock in the morning and getting the eggs and making pancakes with my grandmother. Doing the chores. Yeah, that's what, yeah, they call that's what it. it was called, chores. Chores, yeah. <laughs> I called it a pain in the chores. <laughs> you know, there were kids in New York City that I didn't realize who grew up in big cities who had never seen a, a, a live cow or a live horse. Or do you, until they, you know, went I was late. in Africa, and actually I met African men and women who have never seen a lion. The people in Africa yeah. have never seen they a said, lion? they've never seen one. They said, where are you going? I'm going to see the lion. A lion? What does it look like? <laughs> <laughs> no, they just live in the city. They don't know about the bush. That's right. I mean, that's what they call it over there. Yeah. Not, they don't call it the jungle. I guess we, we call it that. Yeah, we call it the jungle, and Tarzan calls it the jungle. <laughs> that's that's true. You, you've lost some weight. Yes, I have. You said you lost it to do a picture. I lost the weight to do a picture. I, I lost 20 pounds to do a film, and it kept losing it. I couldn't get it back, you know? And I got real scared, Johnny. Yeah. You know, because I was losing weight, and my pants were falling down. And I said, something's wrong, you know? I, you know, I said, hey, all these diseases around, Richard, finally it's caught up with you, and you, you have one of them, and, and you're going to die. 
<laughs> so I was very calm about it, you know, but I'm going to die. So, so I went and I got the blood checkups. You know, they do your blood and the, the machines on the cardiovascular. Yeah. And all that. And the doctor said, hey, man, you're fine. Great. Fine. Great. But then the next day, my eye went out. <laughs> you know, this eye is blind now. This eye is blind. So I got to go to Jewel Stein Eye Institute. Are you putting me on? Are you, no, are you serious? No, I'm serious. I'm serious. You know, you could hit me in the side. I wouldn't see it coming. I'm sure. No, give me a short right. Just no, check no, it out. I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> we got to take a break. We're going to come back. Okay. And we're going to find out how you're going to gain the weight. Okay, Stay no. where you are. <laughs> anyway. You're talking about the weight loss, about the eye. Now, you yeah. just turned, you had a birthday recently. Uh, yes, sir. I had a birthday. 45. I'm 45, and I'm going blind out of no, the No, no, side. no. <laughs> Does that bother you, the fact that you're getting older? It bothers me in the sense that I'm getting older in age, but I don't feel any older. I know I'm 22. Yeah. <laughs> I know that. I mean, I know I, I, I went out and I bought 22-year-old uh, things to prove it. I got a whole new 22-year-old wardrobe. I know I'm going crazy, but it's all right. And I, I got a sports car. I bought a car, Johnny. It was I understand a, you got a real... I, I got a car like I never had in my life. I got a Testarossa yeah. Ferrari. Ferrari? Yeah. It's a Testarossa, and, it, and it, it's, it's fast. <laughs> uh, no, not only is it fast, it's quick. You know, uh. it's quick. You go, you push together, you go, sound! <laughs> like that, you know, you'd be driving, and I love to just go, Do you ever get it out of third gear here in Southern no, California? No, not, you can't get it out of third gear in, in Southern California. Yeah. Unless you want them people to give you a ticket. Yeah. You know what they say about an automobile? No. An automobile is a man's extension um, of, his, of his virility. In other words, the, the macho image that is a sense of... Yeah, but I feel the macho, man. I'm feeling young. I mean, I know I can make love eight, nine times a night. <laughs> what? I, yes! I'm feeling it! I'm, you know, I know I can. I just need a woman. <laughs> to prove it. <laughs> and I drove this car, I drove my car across the United States, you know. I've never done anything like that in my life. I did it. Richard Pryor got in the car, drove across country, went to Peoria, Illinois. <laughs> Saw me in Wyoming, did you? <laughs> I drove all the way to... All by yourself? Uh, uh, hey. I <laughs> said, well... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, did you have an assistant driver? Or? No, no assistant drivers. No assistant drivers. But I drove all the way there. And it was great. 2,420-something miles. And I hit it. And this lady, was. she said, press it, press it. She kept saying, press it. And I, I was getting it, Johnny. I was getting it. Mm, and, and 90. Sometimes I've never been 90 in my life. I was getting it good. Mm, 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 mm. And the car was just like that, just sweet. And one time I was driving straight, and I looked down at the speedometer, just a glimpse, you know, because you don't look down too much when you're driving no. fast. I looked down, and the speedometer said 160. What? And the car was just easy. And I said, this car is going to kill me. <laughs> and I was shaking like this, and, and the car was just... Mm. I had to let my foot up off the, off the accelerator, man, because it was beautiful, old John. That's not fun. Oh, man, it was great. And I got enough tickets to wallpaper my house. <laughs> <laughs> but it was worth it. Oh, it was worth it. Yeah, that sounds Police like Police in Wyoming followed me to the motel one night. He said, we didn't get you today. <laughs> but we're going to get you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> but they were sweet. They were nice people, you know? Yeah. That, and I was always scared because you, in those towns, I'd be thinking, you know, some black person and all my, all my messed up thinking that something's going on. Nicest people in yeah. the world pulling a truck stop, and it just was gracious, yeah. you know? And it just treated me nice. People were great. Which, and, and America works. Yeah, yeah, it does. <laughs> it really does. That is right. It yeah. works better than what comes in second. That's right. Yeah, for sure. What comes in second? I don't know what it <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it was deep philosophy. I just thought maybe you'd pick up on that. Yeah. <laughs> Let me ask you something. Okay. You're black. Yes, this I am. This comes as no... Uh... <laughs> 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 
All right. We both do comedy. Yes, we do. You're much funnier than I will ever be, and I'll tell you why. And see if you don't think this is true. All right. There's a saying that for a comedian or a guy that would be really funny, all comedians, you have to come from a, a minority. You have to be uh, kind of kicked around when you're a kid. You have to, you have to suffer a little bit. And out of that experience, yeah. which you use in your act, it makes you very funny. You know, I grew up in, uh, in Nebraska, and you don't see a lot of, uh, you know, different varied kind of people. Is there any truth to that? No. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. Johnny, that symposium on comedy no, was just but, shot no, down. No, but Johnny, you but know, you draw on all of you've that. been doing this for I don't know how long, 25? 24 years. 24 yeah, years. But... Johnny, you are funny. You no, ain't not... nobody in the world can get up and do your own. Now, now, listen. Now, you can't. Now, I didn't. Now, come on. I, I, we know each other too well. I didn't I know do you, that I know so you, you could say that. I wasn't fishing for compliments. No, I'm not. Because you would come on and say, Rich, hey, how about a compliment? No. <laughs> no. But. But since you're on a roll, you go right ahead. I mean, you're no, a guest. But you come out here, man. It's the nights when you come out and do the stand-up and the jokes don't go. That you keep doing it and make it work. You stand out here, you have the tenacity and the, the guts and the intuitiveness to just make people love you anyway. And I know other comics could come out here and do that and, and get hit with cameras. <laughs> You know, well, that's nice of you to say. But no, but you do, Johnny. But you there do, is you know, something about the background. I got a gift. You got a gift. We both are in the brotherhood of the comedy, making people laugh. Yeah. That's all I know. I don't know nothing else. I'm glad I got this. Thank God gave it to me because I don't have nothing else. Yeah, if you can make I people laugh, well, that's a lot if, if you got that. Yeah, if I don't make people laugh, then it's a divorce. That's right. <laughs> Let's not even get into that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not even touch that. <laughs> you and I are a great record. We, we got a little clip here from your picture called Critical Condition. You play oh, yeah. a doctor. A doctor who is not a doctor, but they thought he was a doctor, so he has to act like a doctor to get out of getting killed by some gangsters. And I guess these are two little pieces that are, have been joined together to show your competency, right? Yes, as a, as a member of the medical profession. Yes. Okay, yes. watch the monitor. Try this for size. and techniques of when the cast is real big, the bone sets harder. This is, you're gonna like this, this is good. I'd, I'd like for you to do me a favor, however, when you take this cast off, I'd like my ring back. It's in here, see? This is, this is good. Oh, this is gonna set good. Wonderful, <laughs> critical condition. You can join. I, I, just, I did this film with Michael Aptep as the director, fine English gentleman, a very sensitive director. Can I name some people in the movie? Yeah, real quick. Okay, uh, real quick. Okay, Rachel Tolkerton, she's wonderful. Bob Dishy, uh, oh, Bob Saget, and Tex Cobb is in it. Oh, yeah, Randall Tex yeah, Cobb. Randall Tex sure. Cobb, and a, a lot of good people whose names I didn't mention tonight. Please don't be mad at me. They'll understand. But me. they're great. They'll, you'll understand, won't you? Yeah. Sure you will. Good okay. luck with that. I hope it's a big hit for I you. I hope so, too, Johnny. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. Thank Sean Penn, sir. Okay. <laughs> my, uh, my next guest is widely regarded as one of the younger generation's best actors, and so it's a pleasure to welcome him tonight. Sean Penn. Good to have you here. Thanks. I, I thank you for coming tonight. You, you know, you have made yourself uh, conspicuously unavoidable, unavailable to the press generally and the media. And yet, when we called you to ask if you'd uh, be here tonight, you said, uh, "Yeah, why? How, how come now?" Well, uh, for a long time, I was uh, I was kind of this this actor, and I did my thing, and I got away with it. And uh, <laughs> then I got married. 
uh, to not the least visible woman in the world. And uh, the press came down, and they came down like uh, vultures. And um, suddenly I was this actor who did his thing, kind of, who was more kind of known for being a paparazzi basher or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's always been, to me, as, a, as, a, as an audience watching movies, it's always been important to have the most neutral idea about the person on the screen as possible. And uh, that went away with me. And uh, it became, it, it, it started for, for myself, taking me, I watch the screen, it, it takes me 10 minutes to get over the fact that it's, uh, it's, it, it's not the character I first see, it's, well, who's he gonna hit? You know, and um, that's a problem. In other words, what, what, what you're saying, in other words, when an audience goes to see you because of all the stuff that's been in the, in the press, they, they can't dismiss that for a while. In other words, they're seeing I Sean Penn, the guy that uh, is out there, as you said, paparazzi basher. Yeah, it, it leaves you a, a less pure opportunity to do what you do. Yeah. yeah. Well, now, we got a few million people watching us tonight. Uh, is there anything you want to say to them? Well, there's one in particular yeah. I want to talk to. I finally got these new shoes, Madonna, wherever you are. She's, she's out of town, she's been on my case, because I had all these scuffs yeah. all over my shoes. And I'm kind of a same shoe person, you know? I wear the same shoes I every do. day. Yeah. So, I got the new shoes. And she got you the new shoes? Yeah, and also... This marriage is solid. <laughs> when, a, when, a wife, when a wife goes out and buys you oh, new no, shoes... Oh, no, she didn't get the shoes. She's out of town, she got the jacket. But she suggested maybe you should get some new shoes. Yeah, well, she didn't suggest it. It was, a, it was an ultimatum. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go on that show with the scuffy stuff, huh? Right. Let me ask you a question. Um, you're, in the, you're in the public eye. People want to know about you. And this, um, this, this reputation you get is having this, these constant battles with, uh, with the press. W what do you feel as a performer, uh, owing the public if there is such a thing? Or maybe you don't feel that you owe the public anything other than what you do as an artist on the screen. You owe them that, and you owe them to obey the law, just like they owe everybody else. And, uh, and that's, that's it for me. I don't think that... Um... In other words, if you went to a movie premiere or something, and somebody said, you want to take a picture, it doesn't bother you particularly? No, no, see, that's another thing. That's, yeah. that's saying, I'm here, I, you, you're there, whether it's to support Friends movie or whatever it is that you're there for, and, and you go in knowing that that's another thing. But, you know, when you're sitting there on the toilet or something, and you look... <laughs> There's a camera out the window in the bushes. That's a problem. That's a cheap shot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, that's a little tough to take if you're... Uh... <laughs> Do you... Uh, let me draw a comparison. Tell me if you think it might be unfair. Uh, John McEnroe, young tennis player, superbly gifted, you know, as a tennis player, doesn't particularly like it either, and, and is... is and fights it constantly, even with his own, with himself, saying, hey, I know that I, I go out and I do these things. And I'm... But apparently his, his intensity, like yours probably does, and I don't know, is so much in what you do, and I think you're an intense guy, that when you get out privately, you, you might want to hold it back in, but it, it just comes out automatically. Is there, is there any valid comparison between you and, say, uh, McEnroe? I would say um, that there's no way to get around it. It's, 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 it's an immaturity, but... The, the, the problem with it is that nobody can understand how much they go at and they provoke you and they provoke you. And, and so the fact that you can be provoked, yes, that's, that's, a, that's your own problem. Yeah. But uh, that they provoke you happens, you know. Yeah, and once you get that kind of reputation, they really lay it on, don't they? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, there were a lot of photographers at your wedding, right? Because <laughs> I happen to live right next door to the house where you and Madonna were married. I have not seen so many helicopters since the evacuation of Saigon. Uh, I mean, they were choo -choo 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 -choo. from about seven in the morning. You're, you got married in the afternoon. They were hovering not more than, what, 50 feet yeah. above this bluff in Malibu. And you had a couple of hundred guests there. How did you manage to get through that? The t table decorations were being blown off. The guys yeah. were hanging out of helicopters with motion picture cameras. Well, that was okay, because it, it kind of, it, it only lasted for a short period of time. There was 10 minutes outside where that was happening, and there was five hours of a wedding that was a beautiful wedding inside. Yeah. 
But um, it added a size to the event, sort of. Do you know I actually had calls from guys who wanted to come to my house and use my rooftop? And for $50, I figured, well, look. <laughs> what is uh, what, what, what has Madonna brought to your life, your married life? Stabilizing influence at all, or...? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, she's, uh... She's a very special spark. <laughs> well, that's, that's good. You both have a similar sense of humor? She's much funnier than I am. Really? Yeah. I, uh... I sometimes say things funny, but it's usually by accident. She comes in, you know, day in and day out. She's funny. She's just... Very funny. It's nice to be married to people who are really funny. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you. you should... Somebody told me when you, when you, your mother is an actress, your father, of course, is a director. Somebody said when you were 17 and your folks saw your first performance, they were less than thrilled. Your, your mother made a comment about your ability. What'd she say? She said uh, they came and saw the show. It was in a small theater down here in North Hollywood. And uh, she said after the show, she said, you know, uh, I think maybe you shouldn't be an actor. Uh, she, she said you, you were just terrible. And, uh, and I said, uh, but from her, it's okay, you know, because yeah. I know she, she was trying to save me. And uh, I probably should listen, but instead I said, oh, you just didn't understand the character. <laughs> Your mother's still your mother, just a critic, right? Yeah, she's... But you're having great success, and you're, you're a very skilled actor. Well, thanks. So your mother doesn't say that now, does she? No, no, she's gotten to like me better on stuff, but it's, there's occasional things here and there that she's still... But that'll never, that'll never end. No, that'll no, it's good. Yeah. yeah. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. <laughs> we just have time to uh, wrap it up. I hope you... Uh... Hope you had a good time tonight. I know you don't do this often, but I thought you were uh, remarkable. It looked like you, had, you enjoyed it. Oh, it's nice. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> go get, go come unglued. <laughs> Richard, you too. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck with the uh, Anything, anything you want to say? Anything you want to tell me before we leave tonight? By this time tomorrow night, I'll be married the fifth time. Really? Whoa. You heard it here first. I'm humbled by that applause.